myself or myself or anyone else. I'd starve to death before I did that. I guess when I think back over what Bill was doing when I met him, he seemed to be a little bit vulnerable to taking second place if he were not encouraged. I'd lost track of anything connected because I didn't think I was going to ever do anything with it. He would have settled into amusing himself and thinking back over what he had been able to accomplish, that he was able to get a gold seal at the Zanarian. And that's when they said they had a job offer for me in the White House. Mr. Leffler and Mr. Brosher stood there shaking their heads in disbelief that I was turning this job down. I think he may have stayed in the shadows. Some people said I was the best, you know, but I never knew. I really didn't care about that part of it at the time because I was always trying to beat myself, do better, you know. Except from the Zanarian, where he took his training, and the invitation from the White House, those are significant, but a lot of times you need the approval of the public. I'd like to be the best in the world. I thought, by golly, I know what it takes, and I'm going to do it too. A person who can give everything and do it with their whole heart, they are just so convincing that this is important. They were having a convention here in Columbus. I was asked to attend, and I said, uh, I thank you for the invitation, but no thank you. He was, at that point, still not sure that he still had the stuff. It's hot, it's in July. That's 22 miles from where I live, but I don't want to come. I wasn't there at the time when they put him in handcuffs and took him down there. He said, ladies and gentlemen, we have William Lilly in our midst. I know you're anxious to see his work. I'm anxious to see it. We heard some tall tales about him. Let's see if he's got what it takes. Hi, Bill. Uh, yeah. Hey, you haven't changed a bit. <laughs> yes, you have. I lie. <laughs> no, you look better than ever. I haven't seen you for 40 years. Or... I'm telling you. Yeah, I think it is 40 years. I've been trying to figure. 1986. Was it 86? Yep. Okay. When you start out in a day, you don't know what significance it's going to have. The Lord has something in mind, and you just take the next step. And then, in retrospect, you look back, and something significant has happened. When you came out of the Zanarian, did you see any possibility of making a living with this? No. None whatsoever. Why do you think that is? Because I'm not going to market myself. I thought they would come to me. Born and raised in Marion, Kentucky, population 3,500. I had a wonderful mother and dad, strict but wonderful. I had seven sisters and a brother. People have often asked, how did you and all those girls get along? I said, uh, we had to get along. My dad wouldn't have it any other way. We we're still close, even though we're miles apart. How are you doing, son? I'm doing great. Are you really? Yeah. Oh, my lands, Joyce. I'm telling you, it's a beautiful day. I'm going to go out and sit on the porch here in a little bit. In school, I really didn't do all that good, especially in certain subjects such as history. I despised history. Anything that I wasn't interested in, I really didn't try to make good grades. His father was a Baptist minister. He and I got along, and his mother and I got along just fine. They were wonderful people. My mother was more laid back and easygoing. As we got older, there was never a doubt in our mind that my dad loved us with all his heart. And he was the oldest son, so he had a lot of responsibility put on him. And then having so many siblings under him, I think his responsibilities got heavier and heavier, and he just got used to that. At times, I, I thought my dad was a little overly strict. The older I got, the more I realized how good that was for me. It kept me humble. He told me, son, if you think you're good at something, and I don't care if you really are good, you won't have to tell anybody. 
they'll tell you, and that's the way it's been all these years. I don't think anybody's received more compliments than I have, wonderful compliments. But I never let them go to my head because about the time you think you're good is when you're not good. If you knew his dad, and I got to hear his dad preach, I think, three times. This is when, before it was called the Holy Spirit, it was called the Holy Ghost, and you got the Holy Ghost fire going. And then last Sunday, we dealt with those who deny the total depravity of man, that man is by nature altogether a sinner. Yeah. So what's that make you feel like? <laughs> I, I wish I was sitting down there in front pew and listening to him in person right now. Described in Ephesians 2, 1 as being spiritually dead, dead in trespasses and in sins. that my soul may Just here and there. Me singing solo. I never thought of myself as a singer. My dad thought I could. At age 18, I was drafted into the service. They sent me to Camp Atterbury, Indiana, where I was inducted. And so me and a bunch of the other guys just got in our uniforms and hadn't gotten in them yet. And we're sitting around waiting on further orders. And the radio was on. And all of a sudden, six hours after we'd been there, on the radio, it says, General Eisenhower informs me that the forces of Germany have surrendered to the United Nations. The flag to freedom fly all over Europe. You ought to heard a shout and holler. <laughs> so I was inducted six hours before the war was over. Her excitement soon ended because they shipped us not long after that overseas to Germany to relieve the fighting men. I was allowed to make a long-distance phone call to my home, and it cost $12 for three minutes. And that was big bucks for a phone call back then. It was seven hours difference in time from my hometown to Germany. My dad knew that I was anxious to get back home, and he said, son, I want to tell you how close we are to one another. He says, the moon that you're looking at now, I'll be looking at it before too long. <laughs> and that meant a lot to me. <laughs> Got discharged and was ready to come home in Trenton, New Jersey. I got a Greyhound bus. My dad and uh, some of the family was going to meet me in Evansville, Indiana. That's 65 miles from my hometown. I felt like I was walking on gold when I walked up to the entrance of my home, the gold two-story home. Then it wasn't long after that that dad wanted me to go to college. I really didn't want to go, but he wanted me to go so bad. So I said, well, where do you want me to go? <laughs> He said, well, how about Bowling Green? That's just 150 miles from home. I said, that's all right. So I went, and I let it be known that I wasn't interested in the grades I was making. I mean, that didn't bother me any at all. I, I wasn't worried about it at all. I just thought that's just the way it is. But they had one course in penmanship. The professor teaching penmanship, he not only wanted me to write exhibition for the class I was in, he wanted me his other penmanship classes so they could see me write on the board. He said, he's one in a million, one in a million, and you won't see anything like it again. And I thought, man, what's this man talking about in here? After I'd been there a year, my penmanship instructor said, young man, you're in the wrong place. And I said, oh, I know that already. I'm through. He said, well, I'm going to tell you where you should be. And he told me about the Zenarian here in Columbus. And I took him up on his advice and came here. And that's how it all started. <laughs> So basically, Bill Lilly is the embodiment of that whole period at the Zenarian College where the ornamental penmanship was taught correctly by people that were true masters of it. I had tried to imitate the script with a pencil. Okay. <laughs> so you saw it in books or something someplace? In doctor's offices. Oh, you did? Okay. Yes, and did. so you would try to do the same thing yeah. with a pencil yeah. to just kind of study the shapes and... Yeah, I did a pretty good job, too. Okay, okay. Yeah. 
And plus, his you know his ability with this stuff was was remarkable. So he's got a real natural ability with art. I don't know if I ever showed you his paper cutting ability. You know, he out of the blue, he can take a folded piece of paper and make it look like almost any animal you want. One thing that did sink in as strange was when he would cut out those animals out of paper just freehand with scissors, because he would do that all the time for me. And he took an ordinary piece of paper and he clipped out this horse with a pair of scissors. And I thought, well, how, how does somebody do this? I love that. Like, I loved seeing him do that. And every time I came over, I wanted him to do another one. Were you already able to do the silhouette work with the scissors then? Oh, yeah. Okay. So you had a certain I could do facility that. with your hands. Oh, yeah. I could do that when I was six years old. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. A prodigy. You're yeah. a bit of a prodigy. Yeah. My dad had been uptown to get groceries, and he came back, and I was sitting in the floor in the middle of the dining room. Cutting out a horse, I knew what horses looked like. There's a lot of show horses down home. Stopping dead in his tracks, he says, "Son, did you just do." That? I said, "Yeah." Took me uptown, showing me off for different merchants, and uh, I had a crowd of people saying I was bashful. I didn't want to do it. Dad made me do it. He was so proud of that. The Zanarian College was first founded by Charles Paxton Zaner, Elma Ward Blozer, and also Lloyd Kelchner. Earl Lupfer was known as the principal of the school, and Lupfer was there until I think it's closing. I went on the GI Bill of Rights at the Zanarian. Bill actually existed in that environment. He was taught by the old masters. And so uh, he wasn't just taught in grocery script. Bill could do incredible text lettering. He's also very proud of his German text lettering, which is pretty amazing. And worked loading milk trucks at night from midnight till four in the morning. I hated it. After I'd been in the school for six months, one of the bosses come around, Parker Bloser, and says, Mr. Lilly, would you be interested in working for us part-time? I said, absolutely. I said, what would I be doing? He says, just what you're doing right now. Why don't you be doing it for money? We'll let you attend school instead of eight hours a day, five hours a day, and you'll be writing script for us five hours in the evening. That's a total of 10 hours with that pen in my hand. And he said, I almost burned out because, you know, he was a very active young man. He had to be because he was a very active older man. He said they had a room on the top floor where they had supplies that they would sell. Every once in a while, Mr. Lepfer would take him up there and something would catch his eye that he would want. And Mr. Lepfer might say something like, you really like that, don't you? And, and Bill would say, oh, yes, sir, I do. And Mr. Lepfer would give it to him. And Bill never forgot that. The instructor, Mr. Lupfer, would always come up just about every hour or so and work with us one-on-one. -on -one. Well, Bill lived that, and remember, it was also a pretty intense program. You were being put through the paces there. And he worked with me more than he did the others because I was showing much more interest than the others were. I consider myself a student of Lupfer's in the sense that I work with Bill. Bill's a student of Lupfer's. So I do consider myself part of that lineage, but he, he lived it. One of the requirements for graduation, if you went there for a certain period of time, was to write your own certificate. And so Bill has a Zanarian certificate. It wasn't something that was printed for him. He had to write it in the hand at which he was good at. And in this case, it was in grocer script uh, or engraver script. And once it's written and it passes, it's signed by the president and the principal of the college, in his case, Parker Zaner Blozer and Earl Lupfer, the legendary teacher at author of the pages in the Zanarian Manual. And it was also graded with, with seals. And there were three different seals given. I said, so, so then what happened? So you got your certificate done and everything. And he said, well, they took my certificate and they took it downstairs because now they're going to to decide whether it gets the gold seal, which is the highest honor, the green seal, which is maybe a B kind of thing, or you get the red seal and Bill said, it's like failing in Bill's eyes, it's like failing. They told me that very few had ever gone away from there in the script with a gold seal. Well, that made me want it all the more. I wonder what they're doing down there. And Bill said, I don't know, it's taking a lot of time and it's not that big. And he said, well, I'm gonna go down and see. Now, not Bill, but the other student. And Bill said, what are they doing? He said, the two of them have a big old magnifying glass, and they're looking at every letter. With a magnifying glass? And Bill said, with a magnifying glass. And he said, when they finally came up, and he had the gold seal, that's the ultimate, of course. They gave him 
30 year old walnut ink. And he said, Darlene, they gave me just the right amount so that the last letter of my certificate used the last drop of ink. Bill worked hard on this certificate, right? Put all this work and effort into it. Now someone's about to come by with a dip pen and sign it. And trust me, you can make a mistake quite easily. So if you look at the signature that's on that, you know, he says, Zaner Blazer took an uninked pen point and oblique holder. Above where he was going to sign, started making a design with his hand in the air. He inked the pen point, made the design more, and then landed it and made it quickly. I'd be so nervous trying to sign that. And if you look at it, it's, it's just beautiful. For many of us who do this, you know, we dream about that stuff. Maybe we over-romanticize it, you know, because when you talk to Bill, for Bill, that was a job. You know, he, he enjoyed it, he loved doing it, but it was, you know, he was looking to make, you know, make a living doing it. And that's when they said they had a job offer for me in the White House. And I asked him how much it paid, and it wasn't that great. It's kind of like a truck driver's union skill. So I turned it down. Mr. Luffer and Mr. Broser stood there with my certificate in their hands that they'd show me I had a gold seal, shaking their heads in disbelief that I turned this job down. There's a passion that drives you into I'm not saying Bill didn't have that. I'm sure he did to be able to do it, but it was more of a practical thing for him. You can't take a job at the White House if you can't support your family doing it. When I first moved down here, I was offered a job at the White House. And I said no. It wasn't a good time. And maybe that's how he felt. It just wasn't a good time. I'm more inclined to think that he might have burned out and just shucked it all. He's had a lot of jobs in his life. He's never considered script a job, but if he had ever had to do it as a job, it would never have been his love anymore. Did it change the path of his life? Obviously it did, but no one can say if it changed for the better or not. He can only say that, I think. He would have been under the gun all the time, and he doesn't work under those conditions. He works when he wants to work. I still enjoy doing it. But I like to take my time. I don't like to be rushed. I take my good old time. That won't work at the White House. You either live with the decision and find that it was the right decision, or you have a little bit of regret. And sometimes we regret decisions that wouldn't have been good for us. There's no way of knowing. I turned it down, and I went right downtown to Lazarus that very same day and got a job driving a furniture truck. He just took off uptown and got him a job at Lazarus. Like, my art, goodbye. And it's like he forgot all about it. And he made more money driving a truck than he would have made at the White House. He eventually began working for International Harvester, where his pen work kind of went into the background. I, I do feel like things happen for a reason, and you know, we do what we need to do at that time. But when he began doing pen work again, he got a call from the White House again. About 15 years after I left Lisanarian, uh, I get this letter from uh, Sanford L. Fox. This is an interview with Sanford Fox, chief of the social entertainment office of the White House. I've been the head of the office uh, since 1961. I wanted to know if I'd be interested in a job. To come work at the White yeah. House. And I wrote and told him no. <laughs> You told, you told the White House no. Yeah. <laughs> Why? Wait, wait, wait. Okay. Why did you say no? I almost knew you'd work under pressure, and that wasn't for me. So he made the right decision, but twice being offered a job at the White House, and twice he turned it down. I thought because I had the skill that I had that I should make big bucks. We used to roller skate a lot, and then one Saturday night, he was there. We didn't know each other, and he was always the main skater because he was so good. He could spin, he could jump, he could do almost anything. Of course, everybody thought it was interesting. They liked to watch him, and of course, I took on that right away. So he just asked me one time if I could skate with him, and I said, sure. And it seemed like every Saturday night he was there, and I decided I'd be there every Saturday night, too. <laughs> <laughs> Our first date was a um, circus. I was just kind of a little bit leery about him for some reason, not knowing him and going off to a circus. You, know, you just don't know. She was 16 and 
You know, he was 15 years older, but she didn't know exactly how old he was, and if she did, she didn't tell anybody. Well, I didn't tell my mother and dad, of course. I kept my mouth shut. <laughs> By the time everybody found out, it was too late. <laughs> it ended up working out okay for him. He said, when's the next holiday? He never kept up on days or dates or anything. He goes, well, I'm gonna come up and get you. We're gonna get married. That was the proposal? Evidently. <laughs> That's about as good as I got. <laughs> I ended up getting a job eventually with International Harvester in the depot here in Columbus, parts depot. He had that job at Harvester for probably 20 years, and he hated it. He liked Harvester, it's a good job. Met a lot of nice guys, and uh, they had a lot of fun together. Other than the fun times with his friends, he hated that job. It was just a paycheck. We kind of clicked from the time I first met him. He had a uh, kind of a dry sense of humor. I worked with him for 16 years at International Harvester. We became pretty close. We were very good friends. Always playing tricks on people. A lot of them didn't catch on right away, which made it even better. Uh, he was an instigator. I, I always said he was the shortest guy that was hard in at International Harvester on 3600 Solomon Avenue. and he says no. As small as he was, was probably one of the strongest ones in the group. The thing about it was he was put together like a rock. He could outbench most of us who was doing it, he could deadlift most of us. There's this little guy that I noticed was lifting things that I thought he shouldn't be able to lift. From then on, it seemed like it was a contest to see who could do the most, the fastest, the quickest. And he always beat me. I need you to tell some good stories about him. <laughs> now, I'm not asking you to lie, but some tall tales would be nice. Yeah. Do you think Terry will be funny? Uh, it's hard to say. Tell me a little bit about what it was like to work at International Harvester. It wasn't any fun. That's why we cut up a lot. <laughs> well, I know the, the thing I missed most of all when I quit Harvester yeah. was the horseplay that went on. Yeah, that's exactly you know? right. Most of us got along real good. Except for you and I. We never did like each other. No. Always been a contest. Terry Little and myself and Bill would try and match each other on who could do the most military presses with a, a truck I-beam. Probably was one of the best weightlifters in the city of Columbus at one time for his weight class. When he and I was lifting weights and we was going to some meets and I told him, I said, you could take first place in your class plus first place in the class above you and he never would enter. We tried to talk you into doing it. I didn't want to do any paperwork. You had to do some paperwork to get in. Uh, yeah, sign your name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you couldn't do that. At my best, uh, I was benching 240, squatting on 300, and deadlifting 375. And I weighed 132. Yeah, and that would have taken first place. Even now, he'll say, yeah, you remember when you, I, yeah, okay, Bill, yeah, you, you could do more than I could do. Yes, I remember. You beat me. You beat me. He rode a lot of bicycles. I kept talking about, well, I got a horse that's pretty fast. <laughs> and he says, you, I can outrace a horse. It went on for a month. Yeah. Finally, I says, I'm going to set up a date. How many people showed up, Bill? A lot. A lot. In preparation, <laughs> I made me a big sprocket where the pedals are. It was so big that I could hardly pedal it. <laughs> <laughs> but once you got going. Yeah. Terry gave me a head start halfway in the race. He passed me. And he was strutting his stuff away. I, I didn't have a chance with him on that. It was the only one I won. Yeah, that's right. Not bragging, but I beat the little guy. And you oh. didn't really do anything. Your horse did it. Yeah, that's right. What are you talking about? <laughs> Thanks, Bob. <laughs> He would pull all these pranks on these new guys, and all the other guys would just totally support him 100% until he would get in trouble, you know? <laughs> as many times as he'd uh, trick someone, he was always able to trick them again. They had these eye beams that went up to the ceiling. And he could climb up a steel beam just by grabbing a hold of it and climbing up like a monkey. I could go up like a monkey. Terry, I can't help because you, you 
couldn't do it like I could. I just, uh. He said something about it. he could beat me climbing a pole. And I said, you can't beat me up climbing a pole. He said, well, yes, I can. And I said, no, you can't. He says, I can do it right now. I said, you can't do it. You have no chance. I says, right after break, we'll go out there. We'll get on the first pole we see, and we'll see who gets up at the top first. So he latches onto the beam, you know, and he's having a little bit of trouble getting up. You know, he, he gets halfway up. He's halfway up. And I look around this way, and I look around this way, and he's not anywhere to be seen. Here comes some brass, and I sneak around the corner. They're heading right for where Terry is. Haven't seen him yet. They never looked up, and I didn't make a sound. I shimmied back down after everybody left. That can either make you feel really good or really stupid, but I beat him. That means I felt good. He said I was halfway up there. He's lying. What am I supposed to do? And I just stayed right there until it cleared out. <laughs> but he was all the time con at somebody. I was up there before you could have got up there. Oh, no. No, no. Nah. If, if you're going to start lying, we're just... You know, <laughs> just call me this question, you're going to start lying. <laughs> oh, you haven't lied at all. Yeah. He had this guy believing that he was blind. And he says, well, how do you drive that forklift? These IBM cards, these are Braille cards. I run my fingers over it and I read the Braille. He says, really? And I had a load of, load of car batteries on the skid. And he said, where's those batteries go? I said, at the top of the rack here. Oh, he said, I'll help you. I well, boy, I'd appreciate that. I'll say, because it's hot in here. So he starts grabbing one of them and trying to climb that rack with a battery under his arm. Well, couldn't you just lift the, the whole pallet up? To yeah. The top? And, and that's it's blind. You can't see where it goes. <laughs> I was trying to give him a hat. <laughs> he never did catch it off. My supervisor come by. He says, is this what you're supposed to be doing? He said, well, I don't know. Said, this guy here is blind. And, he said, and the <laughs> supervisor said, Lilla, you're doing it again, aren't you? The best one was when I told him I couldn't fly. He almost got fired for that. Bill was very good at speeches. He could give a speech in front of anyone. He gave a speech one time on how to fly. <laughs> I want to clarify this, because I was there. We knew he couldn't fly. <laughs> yeah. But we just couldn't help no. to see what was going to happen. He had a lot of friends at Harvester. Everybody liked him. I don't think there was anybody that didn't care for Bill. The guys from Harvester, we'd all laugh and have a big time with his foolishness, you know, and, and his bikes. He decided he was going to make a big wheel bike. It was quite an ordeal when he was trying to build that high wheeler. He had a lot of problems. And I had just purchased a little welding type thing. He took bicycle rims and welded them together some way to make the big wheel. And then he used a rubber hose to, for, for the tire. And when he finally got it done, that was, he was so proud of it. I was took. I told him, said, you'll never ride that thing. You'll get hurt. It took me about two or three tries to get on it, but I did ride it. I think the dispatch was out and uh, filmed him doing that one time. I'm not sure where his idea to make that came from at all. He would ride it, you know, all over the neighborhood. And when he did, it's kind of like the Pied Piper. Kids would come out of nowhere with their bikes and just start following him to see it and watch him ride it. Had you ever ride it? Oh, the high wheeler? No, mercy me, no. <laughs> Never. And I wrote it. I didn't write it as often, you know, as he did, but I wanted to learn, and I did, and I was happy that I did. He's amazing. Uh, he's done so many different things. I know he had a bike shop at one time for handicapped people. I remember the kids and their families coming over to the house to look at the bikes. He had met a couple that had a handicapped child. He started making uh, these bicycles. The bikes were made for kids who were paralyzed from the waist down. The pedals were where your hands go. And I loved how excited their families got and they would cry and be really emotional. And I thought that was really cool. As I got older, that's when thinking back on all that, I realized how unusual that was. And, you know, I got a much deeper respect for him. If you look back on it, you say, yes, what he was doing was putting this behind him and saying, well, I'm never going to be able to do anything with this calligraphy. Why not just tinker with this and tinker with that? How many of the coworkers that you guys all worked with, Yeah. how many of them knew about his penmanship? 
You know, I'm not sure that there was many that did know because Bill was never one to toot his own horn, so to speak. You know, he never talked about it. You had you almost had to ask or you had to go to his house. And then after you see it, you start asking questions. Maybe one time when I was at his house, he showed me some of his work. And gosh, I just, it just floored me. Very few of them knew anything about it. I didn't tell anybody about it hardly, except for a handful. I, I was amazed the first time I seen you do it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I was at your place. Yeah. And you told me you could do it. And I, and I looked at you like, yeah. I, I didn't know anything no. about it because he lifted weights. He, he walked yeah. on his hands. You, we had a, he had a pegboard over at his house that he could walk up and down it. And I finally yeah. got so I could do it one time. That's not easy. No. So, so you, you always thought that there's no way somebody can be unique with their hands. The little I knew, I don't even know how to spell calligraphy. I just know what it means. But I, I knew that it had to take so much ability with your hands. And I thought, well, you know, his hands aren't made for that type of thing. Yeah, you'd think. You wouldn't think the two would go hand in hand at no. all. What I what I did wasn't calligraphy. It was above calligraphy. It was called engrossing. You know? It bothers him to this day when I say, you're, you're a great calligraphist. He says, no, and he uses all these other words to describe what he does. Everybody who sees my work or Bill's work or any penman's work always said, oh, you're a calligrapher. And that just sets Bill crazy. I'm a penman. Calligraphy is child's play compared to what we do. Some people like to call copper plate. And he said, well, it's not copper plate. This is engrosser script. When the English writing masters wrote a specimen, they gave it to the master engraver. They would then take that, and they would transfer it to a copper plate and engrave it for intaglio printing. And we think because of that, the term copper plate was somehow used. What Bill does is in grocery script. He's very consistent about that. Uh, the term copper plate was never really used at the Scenarian College. Uh, they look at themselves as being penmen. You know, they would never refer to themselves as calligraphers. Not that there's a bad connotation, it's just not what the historical precedent was. They were penmen, they were engrossers. Call it what it is. This is engrosser script. Yet, in the modern mind of people, it's calligraphy. In an actual sense, Bill represents that historical legacy. And there are people who say, well, it's okay to use these terms. No, but that's not what was done back then. But it, it just baffled my mind that someone had this mental capacity and this agility and worked at International Harvester. He was totally doing all these physical things, you know. It was in a totally different direction than art. So I think he just forgot that dream and put it away and just said, well, I'll just put my head down and go to work, and that's what I'll do. All those years lost, I feel really bad about that. When you don't have a way to compare your work to others, you don't know where you stand, except from the Zanarian, where he took his training, and the invitation from the White House, those are significant, but a lot of times you need the approval of the public. I think in the beginning, he would have liked for his art to have come out, but he didn't know how to do it. So it didn't, that's why it lay dormant for so long. So it was hard to believe that somebody of Bill Lilly's quality and capability was right here in Columbus. That's where all the fireworks went off when I reached his house and started visiting with him and then seeing the work that he did. He said, uh, I don't think there's anybody can do what you're doing. Oh, I said, I think there is. He said, well, time will tell. Step upstairs, sir. Be here? Look. First room on your left. That's my studio room. Oh, okay. Now, take a look at it. Is that where I watched you? Has that always been your yeah. studio? Oh, okay. Oh. Oh, yes. Oh, wow, wow, wow. Oh, my goodness. Woo. Oh, for God. Oh, wow, look at this stuff. This looks familiar. Oh, my goodness. Oh, yeah, I've got some of these he did for me. He's surrounded. Hmm. Oh, this is. Wow. Mm -mm. 
I think this is the one he did in for graduation. Yeah. I still say, how can a human hand do that? Oh, it's beautiful. Ooh. Hmm. Amazing. Those hairlines. I mean, it's like a spider web thickness of a line. A hair is almost grossly too fat for a person to be able to have a light touch with their pen not wobbling or shaking on the paper. If you focus on it too much, you oversteer the car, you drive too hard. So you almost have to do it unconsciously, but perfectly. And he did it. <laughs> oh my goodness. It exhausts me just looking. <laughs> Because <laughs> I see the energy put into all this stuff. <sighs> wow, wow, wow. Mm. I didn't remember all the things on the wall. Yeah. Yes. Does that go, well, the penmanship one, that goes back to your start. I mean, yeah. that goes back to oh, yeah. your history. Yeah. Parker Blozer says, young man, very few have left here with a gold seal and script. I just want to warn you. I had to have it. Had to have it. <laughs> so now I tell people I'm the senior master penman in this country. Pleased to know you, Bill. <laughs> I was blown away. He was as good as anything I had seen anywhere in any books. In fact, it was just surpassing what I had seen. But he showed me his work, how he did it. Um, I was there for about three hours. You put me on the map. Well, I remember going back, it was the Iampeth yeah. meeting. For those that may not know, Iampeth is the uh, abbreviation for the International Association of Master Penmen, Engrossers and Teachers of Handwriting. The title of that organization actually intimidates people because that term Master Penman is in there. Iampeth is in its 68th year this year. Started with a group of maybe 20 people or so. Parker Zanerblozer and Earl Lupfer were part of the founding group of Iampeth. We are now at 1,400 members thereabouts. This convention occurs every year, either in July or in August. After visiting with Bill, it was right at this time I went back to the convention. I said, you people, I think, would be very interested to see the work that I have just seen this afternoon. I don't think you would be disappointed. I wasn't there at the time when they put him in handcuffs and pulled him down there. Right away, I said, I'm not interested in any convention, so just let's not even talk about it. Oh, he says, you don't understand, man. Oh, I'm not going to any convention. No way. Well, you've got, no, I don't got to either. If people come at this convention all over the country, they would, they would be blown away by your work. Oh, no, I don't think so. He said, well, you're making a big mistake. I won't be the first one. He didn't even want to go to that convention because it was 20 minutes away. <laughs> That's how stubborn he was. But he was, at that point, still not sure that he still had the stuff. He did, but again, that's Bill. In a newspaper interview, I said, he's a Beethoven. I just wanted to say he's world class. I haven't changed that opinion at all. And of course, many other people would say the same thing. I got interested in the Zenarian College. I contacted Bill Lilly to talk to him about being interviewed. We're delighted to be here today with Mr. Bill Lilly in his studio. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, his career in lettering and his uh, time at the Zenarian Art College. Iampet was the only group around that knew the, knew the history. They knew about the Zenarian College. Now we had somebody in our midst who was actually there, which is really important. The first uh, two or three years after I left the Zenarian, I didn't hardly touch it. I was tired. For some reason, I got to thinking, so I thought, well, I know how to go about it if I don't want to work on it. So I started working on it and trying to improve. I'd like to be the best in the world. I thought, by golly, I know what it takes and I'm gonna do it too. So you really wanted to be the best? Yeah, boy, in this very script. And why that as opposed to, for instance, drawing other things? Because it, it strikes me as being so beautiful and delicate. 
I just love it. When he arrived, he had a few minutes to set up a just a little display of his work lying out on a table. Three elderly men walked back to my work. When they got there, all three of them simultaneously said, Oh my God! Then everybody goes back here. It was like bees to honey. That's right. It was like the whole crowd yeah. that was out here massed in about a six foot circle. Yeah. Saying, what is this? And wow. And they said, you're right, Jerry. <laughs> it's just what you said, but it's more. They were just swarming his work. I was stuffing bills and checks in my pockets. So everything I had in 20 minutes. I began to get interested in it. <laughs> Went out in the hall to call Sandy. He called me at work. He says, you won't believe what happened. He says, up here at the convention. I said, what? He said, all that art I took up here, they bought it. And he says, I got money stuffed in my pockets and checks that you would not believe. And neither one of us, we were shocked. I wish I had a sound recording because there was more excitement there than I usually heard from any penmen that were used to these conventions. And I was at several of them prior to this one, but I'd never heard the excitement and the enthusiasm that Bill's work generated. It was just amazing. I don't think he realized he was as good as he is. They were highly qualified themselves, yeah. but they felt like they were just halfway there yeah. when they saw what you had accomplished. Yeah. And as I say, I met a Beethoven. After all, I'd been taught by the idol, E.A. Lumper, and that's what really got their attention about me. Then they wanted to see me write. So they sat me down at this big table. They're all gathered around this table, 150 of them, waiting to see me write. Joe says, folks, when you see Bill write, you're seeing E.A. Lumper write. He writes just like him. I said, that's enough, Joe. <laughs> that really got their attention. You know, they've been around a lot, seen all kinds of people script. And when, they'd, when they saw mine, they said they'd never seen anything like it, and they were blown away, you know. So I knew I was doing good just by their comments. And there were master penmen there, but they still, I think, were in the shadow of Bill Lilly. There was a time when uh, the convention hailed me as the finest living scriptwriter anywhere. I never knew whether it was true or not. My grand said he'd tell everybody, you know, he's the best. I says, Todd, we don't know that for sure. We've never met everybody that does script. He says, I know it. <laughs> Two or three years ago, I received a letter in the mail from Bill Lilly. Well, this will be interesting. <laughs> and I opened it, and Bill said, Jerry, I want to thank you for helping me get out there in the public. Never received a check of appreciation like that. And so I was amazed, and I said, well, God bless you, Bill. That was just your heart. I'd be satisfied just to be the connector that it, apparently I have been. <laughs> started looking in the paper, trying to help me find something to supplement my retirement. Harvester closed. Terry graduated from high school, and I got a job at Sears. The very same year, I mean, everything was really confusing. She found this little ad in the paper, said they need a shuttle driver at Lane Avenue Shopping Center. I said, well, that won't mount a hill of beans. She said, well, it'd be something. And I said, yeah, I'll go check it out. It was a nice job. I saw it did drive the man. I was a good driver, and they loved it. I hated to get the other driver because he was slow. That lasted for uh, three years. In the latter part of that third year, they talked me into going to that convention, and I stole the show. To make a long story short, they did quite an article on me in the dispatch and had my picture and the whole works. When I saw the article in the dispatch, uh, I thought, wow, I know this guy. <laughs> uh, here's an old country boy that... <laughs> 
can barely spell his name, and he knows this guy is being noticed for this stuff. People at Lane Avenue Shopping Center saw all of that in the newspaper. The minute that was out, people getting under my van, my God, why didn't you tell us you was a living legend? We never knew anything about it. All we knew is you a van driver. I says, you can't believe all that stuff in the newspapers. He says, yeah, all right. You know, and I just tried to make light of it. That's when I think he really decided to go out and do this. It was quite an accident driving these people back and forth from Ohio State University. When I was getting ready to pull away, I had a van load except the seat right behind me, and this lady come running out, wanting to get on, so I opened the door, and she gets on and takes that seat behind me. My ex-husband and I owned the candle shops. She was our manager at Lane Avenue, and that's when she met Bill. On the way out, she says, would you by chance be Bill Lilly? I said, I'm guilty, ma'am. So you're the man with the golden hand. I don't see any gold in this hand. She says, you know what I mean. I said, thank you. That's all I said, till we get down to the lock. It wasn't like she went around discovering people. I think this was an unusual situation for her. Everybody gets off but her and she says, are you teaching this beautiful art for me anywhere? I said, no, I'm not. Well, if not, why not? I said, ma'am, I don't have what it takes to be a salesman for myself or anyone else. I'd starve to death for it, did that. From what I understand, she met Bill and somehow started promoting him. She said, if somebody did that for you and got you set up to teach, would you be interested? I said, I think I'd love it. Well, she says, I'll see what I can do, and she left. He just came home and told me that he'd met this lady on the bus, and he thought maybe she was just talking. And lo and behold, was it within, I'll guess, I don't remember, two weeks or so? Two weeks after that moment, she had me set up to start teaching at Ohio State in Upper Arlington. I had to whip myself into gear, get a manual up. She talked about Bill all the time. It was a big deal. I mean, it was a very big deal to her. For years, it was Bill, 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 Bill. <laughs> One, his work was spectacular. And two, she was so excited for him. She was a school teacher by trade, but she loved the arts. She was the middle daughter of Ted Brown, Secretary of State of Ohio. And then my father's father was Dick Larkins, and he was the athletic director at Ohio State the same years that my other grandfather was the Secretary of State. Wow, that's quite a lineage. Yeah. <laughs> Those are very important people. Yeah, yeah it's been downhill since then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, come on. Man. Yeah. Being there and supporting and loving and giving the way she always did, that was actually her legacy. Anything she got her hands on, she made better. And then she would find people she could help so she could use the creativity. Barbara started it all, because Bill would have never done it, and he would have never known who to go to. So he just ran into the right person, and she decided that his gifts needed to be out in the world. <laughs> and he probably didn't stand a chance. <laughs> I'm Barbara. How are you? Good to see you. Now, we're gonna, everybody stand right where you are for the moment. We're going to pause here in just a moment. I know there's a lot of you that would like to meet the lady who's responsible for that happening. Her name is Barbara Larkin. She's right here. Barbara, <laughs> I tell you, she'd be all over you right now because this would just absolutely thrill her. Then she'd be shy about the fact that she had anything to do with it. I was wondering about how this would feel. I was wondering if this would just bring out how much I miss her and what a lovely, wonderful woman she was. She was so special and so kind and loving to so many, many people. I want to honor her and her, her gifts and everything she did, you know, for me, for Bill, for everybody she came in contact with, because she was really neat, really neat. 
the early beginning classes that I taught, people would come up to me and say how glad they were that I was reviving this art form. I'm starting to get invitations to workshops. I had classes at Ohio State, classes at Upper Arlington, and before long, classes in other parts of Columbus. At one point in time, I had seven classes going in four different directions here in the city. I mean, they were about run me ragged, but I was enjoying every minute of it. Ended up doing workshops from New York City to L.A. and all in between. I mean, I was flying all the time. Had some wonderful experiences, met a lot of wonderful people. It's a, a singular honor to be part of the Book of Honor Committee and to help represent Iampeth in recognizing one of our own. People who are inducted into the Book of Honor are very, very special indeed. It's with great pleasure that I wish to present this year's honoree to us. All I can say is I thank you very kindly for such an honorable uh, gesture toward me. I don't feel that I deserve it, but I'm just human enough to appreciate it just the same. And I thank you very much, and may God bless each and every one of you. To have somebody who shares his legacy from that long ago with the really legendary masters, and to share it so generously, so effortlessly, is, is more than anybody can ask. Let me read it to you. Wow. <laughs> In recognition of senior master penman William E. Lilly, our superior achievement in the fine art of penmanship and in keeping with the tradition of the great master penman of the past, whose skills set the standard by which all future penmen would be judged. And that went on for over 20 years. Then it got to where the flying was becoming a problem. And my wife had an MS. And things were working against me and I just had to give it up. To where now, I just have a uh, private student here and there and now and then. And that's the way I want it. It just amazes me that there are still people that are interested in what I do, and uh, I'm grateful for it. It's just something that I enjoy doing and enjoy getting paid for it. And I'll never get rich on it. You don't get rich in this kind of stuff, but I always try to give it my best shot. In 1991, I went to Rochester, New York, to an Ampeth convention. And in that convention, Bill Louie was making a presentation, and I had the opportunity to meet him. The following year, he invited me to come up and take a lesson. So I went up to Galloway, Ohio, Bill took me to a whole different level. He was a very, very exacting taskmaster. He uh, would push you to do better. While you didn't want to hear you weren't doing pretty good work, uh, it made you want to strive even harder. Well, Bill made a video, I guess it's been over 10 years ago now, a DVD, uh, showing letter by letter how you applied ink to paper. So we're uh, in the process right now of uh, beginning to teach you and in some cases, review you in this beautiful alphabet called Engrosser's Script. And as I do that last stroke right there, I want to harmonize with this over here, stay parallel with it. So I would uh, urge you to, if you're interested in this at all, to give it your best shot and to practice, practice, practice. I've always been fascinated with fountain pens. I went over to Clintonville to a vintage fountain pen place. I picked out a pen that had a very fine line, and the man there said, are you sure you want that? I said, yeah, that's how I write. And he showed me some certificates, and he said, do you know how I learned this? And I said, no, but it's beautiful. And he said, you know that we have one of the greatest penmen right here in Little Columbus, Ohio. Well, Bill Lilly, is, he is, to my mind, the greatest calligrapher in the world and a great teacher. And I said, well, I want his name, and where does he teach? So I got the information, called the school, signed up for the class, and every morning I would get up before I would go to work, and I would practice an hour at a time. So that's how I met Bill. I wanted to be really good at this because I loved it and I started taking private lessons. And that's when I really got to know him a lot better. I started tutoring in 2005, and then 2011, I said, Bill, could you make me a master penman? And he said, let me think about it. 
I don't know how long he thought about it. It wasn't the next day. I even have the email where he said, I'm ready to give you the gold seal and make you a master penman. And I'll tell you what you have to do. So that was seven years, meeting with him every week, without exception. He knows if you don't understand it, he says it one way, he'll say it a different way. And if you still don't get it, he'll show you on paper. And if you still don't get it, he'll cut it out. He'll try different techniques until it's all of a sudden, aha, I get it. Now I just have to make my hands do what I understand. If he has one criticism about your work, and it's always valid, he will find one good thing to say about it too. You're talking to me now, man. So that you never walk away dispirited. And you always want to go back. And he has a depth of soul that a lot of people never develop in their lifetime. My father lives back in Canton, Ohio. So uh, there was an opportunity to visit Mr. Lilly. So I drove down to his house and finally met him. And we had about a, maybe a three hour session. And uh, I learned so much more in those three hours than I ever knew. He would show me little nuances and little things of spacing or how letters were truly constructed and truly made that was just eye-opening to me. It's like doing a letter L. It's just set up in such a format that when he explained it to me, it was kind of like a bright light went off in my head. But the one thing that Mr. Lilly would always do is do it in pencil first to show you the proper construction of how the letters were made and then doing them in ink once you knew how to do them in pencil. We would sit down and talk about the different letter forms and doing different patterns in them. He would write out something, then I would have to write out something below him to see how mine would match up with his. Mr. Lilly did this one, and then I did these two. As we continued over the years, we did pointed pen and we also did broad edge. And he would show those little nuances of how the letters were properly constructed from what he learned at the Zenarian. I've this is my book that I've kept for all these years, and it shows all our lessons. And so I refer to it all the time to make sure I'm doing it right, because once you know how the true letter form is, then you can expound upon that letter form and still make it a beautiful letter form and still take it back to its roots. Mr. Lilly wanted me to become a master penman through him, and I was reluctant. I finally decided I was going to do it. So I did it in 2015. To get something from him like this uh, means a lot to me. Uh, not to anybody else, but to me. So he was real specific on the height of the letters it should be the same as what he had for his certificate. Now, when I'm with Mr. Lilly one-on-one, -on -one, I'll call him Bill, but it's truly out of respect for uh, how much I admire him and his ability. And so it's always Mr. Lilly when I'm in an open conversation. I was able to stay in touch with knowing about Bill through Sandy Monday. <laughs> um, well, Bill looks the same as when I first met him, the first day I met him, I think. Yeah, he looks the same. I think I look terrible. Well, I guess it's a matter of opinion. <laughs> <laughs> then she was a real encouragement to him to get a book published to help others do this type of work. The Art of Beautiful Script, designed by William Lilly and Sandy Mundy, it's in 2003. And he talks about the alphabet, how it consists of compound curves, elliptical ovals talks about the shades and the fine lines. And he goes on to demonstrate, starting with the lowercase letters, and he gets to the uppercase back here. There we go. Explaining with words and illustrations. I wanted to write like Bill so badly. And I kept doing it and doing it, and I hadn't gotten past the word the event or something, two words, after many hours. And I went to bed in tears. I wanted so much to write like Bill. I just couldn't do it. But I kept at it, and he patiently kept teaching me. And 
I don't know. I'm still not there. I'm still learning. But I love this script. Someone contacted me from the Honda Family Services, and she asked if I'd be interested in teaching a class of Western calligraphy to Japanese students. And we invited Bill to teach at the Honda Center. In English, you only have 26 characters, right? And capitals and small letters, that's 52, right? But we have like 5,000. And Bill Lilly's writing, I think he knows what's beautiful in those 26 characters. The writing appears to be so happy, natural, spontaneous, lively. It's so attractive. I just want to learn how he writes so happily. Yeah. Up until Bill came, we thought calligraphy was a very quiet uh, thing to do. Then Bill showed up. And I don't know how he did it, because he doesn't speak Japanese either. Mm -hmm. But he'd have these ladies laughing to the point where people in that other part of the building had to come and ask us to be quiet. <laughs> so he was quite the little troublemaker. But uh, so we had so much fun. And then we pretty much every class at the end of our session, we would come to visit Bill. He has quite a following in Japan, too. <laughs> so that's been fun. I heard about his oblique holder and I wanted to get his oblique holder. So I contacted him. When I met him, he was turning pens out, but the way he turned pens out was with a hand drill. He would go to one of the exotic wood places in Columbus and he'd always buy these woods and the guy behind the counter said, I just have to ask, what are you doing? Mr. Lilly would say, I'll bring you in an example next time. So he'd bring in one of his pen holders and the gentleman behind the counter says, wow, these are really nice. What lathe are you using? And Mr. Lilly would say, lathe? <laughs> he didn't know what a lathe was. And so Mr. Lilly bought himself a lathe. He makes holders for his pens with a little lathe. I was showing my brother one, one day and he said, where did you get that? I ended up getting him one and giving it to him for Christmas and he cherished that till the day he died. He thought that was the greatest thing in the world. When I got some wood for Bill to thank him for something he did for me, he made it into a pen and gave it to me. Whatever you did for Bill, he would almost double it. And when he made a pen holder, he'd say, here. So that's how I've accumulated a lot of them. But some of the unique ones that I've got, I've got one that's got the staff that is composed of a, the aerial of a transistor radio, and another one that he has put uh, oil and ball bearings and things just very creative that no one else could possibly find a pen like that. These are my pen collections from Mr. Lilly. This is one that he and I made together. And this one he signed. He doesn't usually sign them? No. And then he did this one made out of ebony. I thought that was one of his finest works. So let me start with the first one that he made to help me because I have tremors. He cut it in half here, drilled a hole in both sides, put it back together. He stuffed it with lead, making it heavy enough that there's not wiggle room. There's, you know, it just helped my hand a little bit. The first pen that I bought from Bill was this one. This is Coco Bola. This became my favorite pen, but I love this pen. This pen belonged to Master Bill Lilly himself, and Bill used it, and he gave it to me. When I became a master penman, he gave this to me as a gift. Isn't that beautiful? I have arthritis, so he developed this himself, where you can hold it here and here, your thumb will fit there, and you can actually grip it firmly. We have here all of the pen holders that I own, for, that Bill Lilly has made in the last few weeks, wouldn't you say? <laughs> and I think we counted 72. Yeah. And not 
Not two of them are alike. No. They're all different. His imagination is endless. These are just all my envelopes. Trading envelopes is a big deal, right? Oh, yeah. Getting an envelope from people like him or uh, John DeColibus or Michael Soule or Jake, it, it's, it's really something else. That first convention in 1991 in Rochester, he was sitting up at a table doing an envelope and with his magical scissors cutting things out. And all of a sudden he stands up and he says, I want to present this envelope to a, a new member of IAMBA, Jim Davis. And he hands me this envelope and he had cut a pen staff out and he had signed it and dated it. It's one of the simpler envelopes I've gotten, but one of the most memorable. My first one. He took envelopes to a level I had never seen, and he personalized them. When I'd go to the mailbox, it'd be like a museum piece staring me in the face. I have 357 of them, if you can believe that. When he first started making these, it's like, oh, wow, this is really cool. So I'm going to keep these, never knowing that they were going to keep coming. There are some that are so elaborate. Look what he made for Sam. And here's a train. And he sent me this one. And in his letter, he said, so just so you can see that even masters make mistakes. And I'm going, what mistake? And I think maybe this, he dribbled this somewhere and then made that into something. But some of these are more elaborate. I'm going to get to one back here. Oh, he was teaching me how to do lace. And so he does lace on black, and then he did this very elegant envelope. Okay, but this is, this is the best one. I thought this was so beautiful. I said, my gosh, Bill, this is just exquisite. He would come up with a new technique, so he would send it to me. I never counted. They just never end. This was the latest one they sent me. And he was all upset because he did a rocket ship. But he said, I put it on backwards. And I'm going, well, it's, it's re-entering. That's re-entry, Bill. I haven't counted them. I'm sure there's not 385. But Bill's just endless. Well, first having the idea, and then the ability to do it. He's quite a star. <laughs> a humble star at that. The moment I knew that Bill was the right mentor for me, he was just demonstrating the letter A. We just sat down, and then his pen flicked in the middle of a stroke. Now, if you look at any single other calligrapher, they will continue with that stroke. But he doesn't. He stops, and he said, see, this is the thing. If you're already messed up the letter, you." Don't perfect it, just move on, try again. That's exactly how I've been taught to write script. My father divorced my mom because I'm a girl, because of my gender. I've never seen him. I was raised by a mother who taught me to be very old since I was very young. <laughs> a lot like Bill. She would make me write on blank pages of paper, and I would need to write straight. I would go through piles and piles of Chinese calligraphy tracing and brush calligraphy work, and she would inspect them, and she would say, are you thinking while you're practicing, or you're just trying to fill the page? Why does yours look so different from the exemplars? Can you tell me why? She would ask these questions. I came across Bill because I went on Iampeth's website, and I saw that he was described as someone who graduated from the Zanarian College, someone who certified all the penmen we've come to respect. So I didn't think he was teaching anymore. I wrote to him saying, I would love to learn from you. And he actually responded. And he told me, you know, you can come and learn from me. I packed my bags and I went and learned with Bill. Every day, nine to five or eight to five or something. To me, it was like, boom, day's gone. We would start, he would demonstrate, and then he would ask me to write. I always ask him when I write something, I say, how did Lover teach you? Like, would this have been good enough for him? Then he would say, I'm telling you exactly what he would tell me. 
this isn't good enough. It's not delicate enough. It's right, but it's not delicate enough. Delicacy. It took me a long time to really grasp how important it is in script. You can have the right forms, but it isn't delicate. He spends a lot of time making sure that his ink is delicate, making sure that each stroke hairline is delicate, and there is sharp contrast between the hairline and the swell. To get excited about a letter because it is just executed so perfectly. Bill was the first to show me that just the letter itself, A to Z, is an art. I didn't know or think that Bill would tell me that I'm ready. Go make your certificate. And he said that he was going to inspect it the way Lupfer examined his with a magnifying glass, and he did. And going through that process was more important to me than what that shows or says to the world. It doesn't matter that you have a master pen certificate. What matters is there's a new sheet of paper, and now you have to start all over again. The burden is to share the precision of how he taught me, the strictness of how the script is taught, how serious it is to put pen to paper. Today, we put a lot of emphasis on terminology now. Master, and even Bill was uncomfortable with that term when we first started using it in Iampeth. I think when it comes to this form of penmanship and, and engrosser script, you know, Bill's got his doctorate. As simple as that. You know, if you're an 800-pound gorilla, you don't have to wear a gorilla suit. And the same thing with, with, with calligraphy. Eventually, you got to put it on paper. I know I'm just a little old guy that you're looking at right now. Just a little old guy. He's not too smart. Just got a skilled hand, that's all. And uh, here they make an on over like that. It's kind of a thrill. <laughs> I think he may have stayed in the background or in the shadows. But once he was encouraged, he began to thrive with a second career. And he was older, you know? So I didn't ever expect him to start traveling and teaching workshops and all this other stuff that came along with it. I never would have guessed that in a million years. We were all surprised by that, but so proud of him. See, there are people that say you're the best in the world at this. Yeah. Do you believe that? No. I'll tell you why. I don't know. I, I don't know who else. There might be somebody in Russia or Siberia. You know what I mean? I, I just don't know. So what's next for you? I, I'm waiting on summer. How long is it for summer? <laughs> Not fast enough. <laughs> it's been cold. Have you hung the rollerblades up? Last year. <laughs> well, because last time I talked with you, you stopped jumping off ramps with your old Yeah. <laughs> because your daughter told you to stop. Uh, I got to where I was skating like old man. <laughs> I didn't like that. I was trying to stay in good shape. I'm going down, though, because old age just creeps in on you. Uh, I'll tell you, I'm not 90 years old, and I didn't put anywhere near 800 miles on my bike last year. <laughs> but, you know... Old age don't affect me like it does most people. Most people just gives in to it and says, what the hell, you know. Mm. Makes me mad. I resent old age, and I'm mm. fighting it every day. Good for you. Oh, yeah. I work out in the basement. And I'm fighting it. I say, damn it, I'm going to stay young. I told my doctor, that's when I'm going to make myself young again. He laughed his belly. You wouldn't surprise me at all. <laughs> <laughs> Hell, you're 90 years old and you fell off your bike riding the trail. I just said, no way. I know how to handle myself. I've got good balance. I can handle it. I thought I could, didn't I? They just say, looking good. And they want to see me in six weeks. I'm going down to do therapy. Mm-hmm. 
Roberts is uh, the most interesting person I've ever seen. Wow. He was lying. <laughs> Tone. Yeah. Going home. That's what's happening. <laughs> so I'll tell you exactly how I feel, right? I feel like a dead man come back to life. I, I might get surprised, but I might get the older care. I look for me to go home in a week. No, I don't have any regrets about it. Uh, if I would have had, it would be that it wasn't even better than I was. <laughs> I've forgotten probably more than I remember in terms of things he showed me, but all creative, all out of his own mind. I've seen some of my flourish script. That done several years ago. I couldn't believe I did it now. I, you know, I, I don't say that out, boy. I mean, it was darn good, boy. When people don't know what they're doing with flourishing, we call it spaghetti, because it's just like laying down pasta. There's no rhyme or reason to it. All those big sweeping ovals and, and beautiful compound curves going this way and that way. And when Mr. Lilly does his flourishing, there's a reason why there's an oval here. There's a reason why there's a shade there. There's a reason why there's a curve there. Everything is related to one another. And he keeps on emphasizing when you learn that is it's harmony. harmony. I tried some several times during this ordeal. And every time I tried, one quality I really admire about him is that he knows, because of his age, that his script isn't as good as it used to be. I'm trying to move the pen steady. It's very powerful to see him say, you know, 20 years ago, this would have been this. He would name out exactly what he could have done better, but he couldn't see or his hand was trembling. The man that did that, so I hell with it. His grandson said when he was in middle school, and Bill went to a demonstration for the classes, my grandpa is the best in the world. Isn't that right, grandpa? Well, he didn't call him grandpa. He calls him buddy. Buddy is the best in the world. Isn't that right, buddy? And Bill said, I just put my hands in my pocket and kept looking at the ground saying, now you don't know that, Todd, and neither do I. Is there a letter or anything in here? There is. Yeah. You got a knife? I do. Sword. <laughs> oh, that's what I carry, sorry. Can you smile, Bill? <laughs> he has done a lot of good for a lot of people without asking for any recognition and always being humble. He's the most positive person I've ever met. And I try to be like that with everybody. And I try to treat everybody with respect because he does that and he always has. No matter who it was that I introduced him to, didn't matter. He tell him the same stories that I'd heard a million times, you know? But he's my buddy and he always will be. And he probably was the best in the world. Bill taught me uh, integrity, honesty. Uh, he was very forthright, he didn't, miss words and that you appreciate because you're not going to advance in the skill of lettering if somebody tells you you're good and you're not. And he has standards and he adheres to those standards and he's a man of honor. I have the highest respect for him as a penman but the highest respect for him as a human being. And my daughter had just uh, died in an automobile accident and uh, Jim Clark had called everybody for me, another friend of ours. Bill said, I want to do something. Do you have a picture of her? And Jim said, yeah, I got a picture of her. And so uh, 
it's out there. But he did that all in uh, one night, and that was uh, given to me in church. He said to me, Connie, there's no point to write if it's not writing scripture. There's no point. The idea of it as a worship, I think that's what he's getting at. I think, Bill, in this stage of his life, we don't talk about uh, the Lord as much as we used to, and I don't know that it's necessary. I don't want it, no. I think it's a waste of time and money. I mean, in my case it is, because I know how to do that stuff. I can whip myself in shape like you wouldn't believe. Terry can tell you that, yeah. I'm going along with their therapy here. I just can't wait till I can get out and get away from it. Whenever things are going against you, it's easy to drop the hammer, you know. Right now, I only have one thing in mind, get well. And when I get well, look out. <laughs> I think I'm most proud that he did start back up with his art. When he retired, he didn't give up on life and say, well, I'm in my golden years now and I'm just gonna stop riding bikes and I'm gonna just sit around and watch TV and you know, have this illness and that illness. He didn't do that at all and he fought that 100%. And I really respect that. He said, you know, this is a new chapter of my life and I'm gonna go out there and grab what I want and I'm gonna start it and see where it goes. And where it went was beyond everyone's expectations. And so he's had a pretty spectacular life because he made the right choice to do that. And I'm so happy that he did and I'm so proud of him for doing that. And I can only hope that I can follow in those same footsteps. All I can say is I, I thank the good Lord for it. And I never go beyond that. Never. Well, that'll do it. You make it look so easy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not too good at it right now. But I've had my good day. Putting your whole self into something with a laser focus that leaves nothing outside that laser focus, that's about enough to take you to the moon.